this trip is framed as a research endeavor. We're going to the Caribbean for four months to collect data for a number of organizations and participate in ongoing studies related to ocean-borne plastics and shark populations. But really, With the Winds is a gift to ourselves as well because it's what Grant and I truly want to do. We were home for winter break and we were just joking around, talking about what we want to do with our lives. And uh, we're like, well, let's go sailing. And I was like, well, I want to go to the Caribbean. That sounds great. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. The first inklings of the idea for With the Winds got me excited. Uh, latched onto it like, okay, yeah. But how to go sailing and actually afford to be on a boat in the Caribbean and make that possible is a whole nother question. The logistics that are involved in a sea voyage uh, are tremendous. Not just the, the, the scientific and outreach mission, but just the, the sailing part of it. Food provisioning, uh, engineering and repairs. What do you do about water? What do you do about waste? We're both environmental grads, so we definitely want to incorporate that into what we're doing. You see pictures, you read headlines about trash, overfishing, but I wanted to see what what all these numbers, what they look like in person. And there is a lot that you can learn from a classroom, but nothing really compares to when you actually are there and you're seeing it, you're touching it, you're feeling it. So we chose to examine several of the major problems facing marine environments. Overfishing and bycatch are drastically reducing fish and shark populations, and issues relating to the spread and breakdown of plastics are still not well understood. We raised money, took out a loan for the boat, and here we are finishing up our last preparations to uh, sail down the Chesapeake and the Intracoastal Waterway to Beaufort, North Carolina. And the plan there is to meet up with John and Walker. Yeah, I got a great friend, Walker Nambu. He'll be joining us down in Beaufort when we get there. And uh, he's helping us with the offshore, and he is our shark scientist. So he'll help get us started. And my Uncle John is also coming aboard the boat for uh, about two weeks. He'll be part of the rotating watch as we head out of Beaufort and down to the Caribbean. What could go wrong? A lot? But I think we're confident and we're having a really good time here. A lot of work, but it's going well. Last thing to do after we're geared up and ready to go is grab some champagne and christen this boat and get out of here. <laughs> Give it to the wet outstanding. Go! go. <laughs> So Walker, are we gonna catch a shark here? Dude, that's what I'm hoping for. That's why, that's why I'm here, so I'm gonna do all that I can to make sure you guys get at least one or two tags in the water. I get those tags in the water. Something's playing with it. Our oceans depend on the presence of apex predators, such as sharks. Sharks help maintain balanced marine ecosystems, and so their population numbers serve as great indicators for ocean health. By catching and tagging sharks, uh, Grant and Henry are contributing to the National Fisheries Services in their ongoing study on shark populations and their migratory habits. That's what we want, that's what we want. All right, you're on, you're on. All right, well, 
been fighting for about 20 minutes. It's been heavy. Um, looks like it's a big shark. We, uh, there it is right there. Oh, oh yeah. Walker, what do you think about what's going on right now? I think it's awesome. I mean, shit. We finally got a shark. Looks to be a nurse shark. So, we're gonna try to get this tag on its back and somehow measure it. We're not gonna bring it on the boat, it's a little too big for that. But, uh, yeah. This is awesome, guys. No other words. What we got here, Walker? Eight feet? About eight feet, yep. Totally. We tail roped it, everything, had it strung up next to the boat, already with the MDART tags. Um, we were putting it in the right place, um, but actually the dinner sharks do have the, the thickest skin of any elasma brink in general, so um, it bent, I think, two or three tags, and maybe even the tagging apparatus, so <laughs> uh, we decided it was, it was better, since this study was 100% for conservation, to just let it go. We're tagging these for a program that looks at uh, life history traits. And the only way to do that is recapture rates. Um, so not in just an ethical sense, but if you, if you release these animals in really poor conditions, really stressed out conditions where they have, you know, even less of a chance of surviving, then that data, that information that you're working so hard to get is going to be pointless. I wish we had tagged it. I, I really do. But in the end, you know, we did what we could and we learned a lot along the way. So. Can't be mad about that. The day after our encounter with the nurse shark, Walker flew home. Soon after, we headed to the island of Anagata to conduct a plastic survey on our first remote beach. Northeast shore on Anagata. We were pretty curious to see what we'd find on the beach. 30, 40 yards, all this trash. It's not even litter, it's just coming from offshore. Got everything from flip flops to bags, bottles, to parts of a boat, to more flip flops. I mean, we have bottle caps from other countries, a killie BB. I don't know what that is, but just anything and everything you can imagine that doesn't decompose. The, the common question that comes up uh, when you talk about marine plastic debris is, okay, how much is there? And then the next question is, what do you do about it? One of the solutions uh, to the issue of marine debris is, is spreading the word uh, and being an inspiration for others to care. All right, we're about to do our first beach cleanup or coastal cleanup on the island of St. Martin. We just finished our uh, cleanup of Vesa Beach. Made it to Black Sand Beach. We're at uh, the northeast corner of St. Martin at Grand Keys Beach. La Playa Rincon. Northeast coast of Vieques. Arrived in Red Hook, St. Thomas yesterday, and this morning we're going to survey and clean the same beach we cleaned uh, about a month ago. The current. The wave action, we need to bring everything right in here. It's just going to be a pooling region for all the trash to be by. Literally a layer of plastic on the ground, sort of half submerged in the sand. You start digging in the sand, you dig up more. You can walk this beach, I mean, it's probably about a mile long. The whole thing is just covered in trash. Found about 49 pounds of trash. 78 pounds of trash, not even including this big hunk of tar that we couldn't even move. We found this beautiful beach, it's entirely pristine. And then uh, we started looking more carefully and we're looking up in the bushes, the grape seed and the other plants and just finding bottles after bottles after bottles. 
This is how much trash we collect in 30 yards of beach. This is one tiny island in the Caribbean, one tiny part of one tiny island. Once it gets into the marine environment, it's really hard to do anything about it. You have to stop it at its source. Uh, and so that really starts with awareness and education. Uh, people being more conscious about where is that single use piece of plastic going to end up if I use it? Uh, can I try to use it again? So if you can try to stop it at the source uh, before it gets into the, the ocean system, uh, you're already ahead of the curve. Ain't no mercy on a big blue sea. Ain't no mercy on a big blue sea. There's a lot of trash tossing about in the ocean, much of it plastic. And while plastic will break down into smaller and smaller pieces, it never biodegrades, which means there are literally trillions of toxic microscopic plastic pieces in marine ecosystems. A lot of the concern about plastics is that they can have impacts on the marine ecosystem, including organisms that are living in the oceans. Any animal that you can think of is probably capable of ingesting a microplastic. The study of these microplastics is a relatively new one, and there are a lot of unknowns when it comes to determining where these tiny plastics are collecting and in what numbers. This inspired us to take a number of water samples so that we could help identify the concentration of microplastics in Caribbean waters. The biggest concern with the microplastics with respect to ingestion is that we know that the plastics are associated with a wide range of toxic chemicals. Some of those are chemicals that are added while the, when the plastic is being manufactured to give it its properties, to make it flexible or to give it color. But we also know that plastics act like little sponges and basically they are um, attractants for pollutants that are already in the ocean. So things like DDTs and PCBs, these long-lived toxic chemicals that have been in the environment for decades will tend to stick to the plastics rather than stay in seawater or in sediment. So now not only are animals eating plastic, which has no value and can cause internal damage, but there's potential that those chemicals in the plastic can transfer into the animal tissue and either cause harm to the animal or potentially bioaccumulate up the food web. We made sure to get everyone who visited us, friends, family members, and our two interns, Lizzie and Carrie, involved in our work, and ultimately, we acquired water samples from across a region of 500,000 square miles. The samples were sent back to the states for lab testing, and the results have contributed to the Adventure Science Global Microplastics Initiative, which seeks to understand the sources and distribution of microplastic pollutants. If I were a shark, and a big shark too, I wouldn't much care if that looked tastier or if it didn't, because I'm just going to eat it. Tasty. So right now it's raining. Great news. Um, the wind turbine stopped generating power. We don't have the uh, right size tools. We bought a wrench. We bought a small wrench, and it's vanished. It would fit perfectly, but it's, it's who knows where it is. This bet between Grant and I that we have where the first one to cut their hair walks the plank. Um, that's why we both look like cavemen. Um, 
or lacrosse players, whatever you want We were too young to rent cars in the Bahamas, so we got some spiffy beach cruisers, and we've been cruising, been about I think 15 miles now. Yeah, something like 15, yeah. Yeah, around 15, just heading north on Long Island, and we finally found the ocean. Ocean! Woo! This stuff looks old. It does look pretty old, actually. It's been at sea for a while. Oh Whoa. my gosh. Where do we even start with this cleanup? Sure, every little nook in here is gonna have the same thing. You go around the next corner, go around the next corner. And you get to the next corner, there's a resort, and they clean it up, and then you get to the next corner, and it's just back to this again. There's nets, there's plastic, there's freight, bottles, buckets, there's shoes everywhere. I'm at a loss for words, really. Like it's just This is what we're doing to our oceans. This is so much plastic that's wound up on this beach. Tons. Plastic bottle. Plastic bottle. Plastic bottle. This is our data card. You can't count this plastic. There's no way it's all just litter. It's just coming from dumps, it's going down drains, it ends up in the ocean. If everyone walked on this beach, change people, it's eye-opening. I mean, you know, you could cry. I mean, you might, you should cry. I'm digging in plastic. I'm digging in plastic. I don't know what to tell you. This is the sad part. This is the sad part. We're supposed to be hopeful. This is the sad part. Let's hope our documentary doesn't end here. We were pretty subdued the next couple days, thinking about the trash, the enormity of the problem. But the trip, the documentary, it didn't end there. The amount of trash that we found washed up on that remote beach was beyond anything we could have imagined. It also became increasingly apparent how few sharks there seemed to be. We had a really tough time tracking them down. But only a few days later, we caught and tagged a 62-inch tiger. This lifted our spirits. It reminded ourselves that some places, marine life is still thriving and that our objectives and project goals were going well. We'd sailed over 3,000 miles with no major setbacks, no big accidents, no holes in the boat. Okay, here we go, girl. And she's off. Woo! If I could take an audience to one spot that we visited, it would be Culebrita. This tiny uninhabited island east of Puerto Rico does a perfect job of illustrating what we found by sailing to the Caribbean. 
the sheltered northwestern side of the island where you arrive and grab a mooring is breathtakingly beautiful. You have this postcard perfect white sand beach, palms and other vegetation. It's actually a nature reserve that protects a breeding ground for endangered green sea turtles and other species. But when you go ashore, follow the Lone Trail inland, you come to a sign that points towards the other side of the island. The sign reads, Trash Beach. And this beach, over on the eastern windward side, is covered in plastic and other debris that constantly washes ashore from the Virgin Islands and beyond. I can think of no better microcosm for the state of the environment in the Caribbean. There is amazing beauty. These relatively healthy marine ecosystems, successful efforts to protect and restore biological diversity, and there's also the very real and visceral presence of human activity and pollution. It's not paradise, but it's not hopeless either. When we sailed into Florida at the end of our journey, the immediate reaction was, wow, we're done. We did it. I mean, looking back, there we were, two friends right out of college, aiming to, in some way, center our careers around environmentalism. And we also had this kind of crazy dream of sailing, going on a big adventure. So we figured out a way to essentially combine these two things. We took our career goals and our personal interests, our passions, and puzzled them together. But in the end, our personal story, the success we had, it doesn't matter if we as a global community don't start changing the way we think, changing our behavior, protecting the ocean. Be aware of what actually happens when we throw something out. Make the connection between a faraway beach covered in plastic and the products that we buy and use every day. Let's try and limit how much plastic can get out in our environment. As my friend Dr. Shell put it, for anyone who enjoys a day at the beach or looks out upon the horizon and is inspired and can even have a hint of saying, oh yeah, I love the ocean. Well, then take a little bit of action and change your mindset. If we were able to help inspire at least a few others to take their own actions and make a difference themselves, now that would be the real success. I'm gonna ride this wave, gonna ride this wave downtown. Gonna ride this wave, gonna ride this wave downtown. Gonna wait on my guitar, shake this city to the ground. Coming up from the river, have some deeds that gotta be done. Coming up from the river, got some deeds that gotta be done. Any man sitting in my house best to hire himself a gun. I'm gonna ride this wave, ride this wave in town. Gonna ride this wave, ride this wave in town. Gonna wait on my guitar, shake this city to the ground. We need to go crazy a while ago, so we should just probably start going crazy. We'll make better footage anyway. And we have left Bimini. Left Bahamas. Left the Caribbean. Taking pictures of the sunset. It's really pretty. Wow. Gonna wait on my axe. Shake this. 
See that? See that foot there for extra grip? The B-roll. It's what you guys want. You want the B-roll. You don't know you want the B-roll because you think you want the reality, but all you want is the B-roll. If you're watching the documentary right now, or bonus feature, you probably will have already have seen the B-roll of the winch that we're going to film tomorrow. <laughs> I'm blown. <laughs> The truth of the documentary. <laughs>